Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us um, for this evening's presentation. And just want to say good afternoon to our presenters who are going to be providing um, a presentation and uh, share resources regarding the Carlisle Indian School Digital Resource uh, Center. Um, my name is Sarah Dibdahl. I'm the Senior Director for Cultural Heritage and Education, and I have the honor of um, moderating tonight's um, presentation. And just, you know, thank you so much for taking time uh, out of your days to come and hear and, and learn about um, this, this resource for our families. Um, we also have uh, Dr. Tina Woods, who is here with us this evening. She's with our Community Behavioral um, Services Division. And if you find yourself needing space and just wanting to process this, um, the information that is going to be shared, please know that she is here as a resource and we can create a breakout room. Um, we also have Neshka Kuge, who is with us, who has been just a tremendous support in uh, coordinating and, and bringing this all to life and fruition um, as far as uh, providing this opportunity to share on, on the resources and, and information and data um, about our children and our ancestors who um, attended and may still be at Carlisle Indian School. Um, this evening, we are joined by Barbara, um, Susan, and Jackie, who we've had the opportunity to have um, two in-person sessions at the Elizabeth Pradovich Hall to learn and hear about the um, digital resources that they have uh, collectively developed and are sharing um, throughout our region for our families to, to learn about. Um, the archival materials and data that exists. Um, Susan is a, a professor um, at Dixon, Dix, Dickinson College, that does tongue twister for me, and she's the co-director of the Carlisle Indian School Digital Resource Center and co-editor of the Carlisle Indian School Indigenous Histories, Memoirs, and Reclamations. Um, Barbara is the retired Carlisle Indian School Archive and Library Specialist, um, who, which is located in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And for the past three decades, she has worked with individuals and nations to develop the www.carlisleindianschool.org. Um, and then Jackie is a professor of American and Indigenous History um, and works as a partner for the Carlisle Indian School Digital Resource Center. So thank you so much and Grins Chish for being here this evening. Um, tonight's flow is that we have um, uh, our three presenters. We will start with a video and Susan will be kind of doing an introduction. Um, and then Jackie will be providing some comments before we go in, into the PowerPoint, which Barbara will share. Um, and so if we're ready, uh, we will go ahead and share the video. Um, and please know that if you have questions, uh, please use the chat feature and we will be tracking that and, and happy to, um, to answer those questions throughout the presentation. Thank you, Gunachish. Gunachish, and we really wanna thank the Klingit and Haida Central Council for inviting us both to Juno for the in-person um, events and also for this virtual uh, presentation. We were just so hospitably treated and taken care of. So we really enjoyed our time in Juno and really appreciate um, the opportunity to share some of the resources uh, about the Carlisle Indian School. So as Sarah said, we're gonna start with a 14 minute trailer of a documentary titled The Lost One's Long Journey Home which tells the story of two children who were captured on the Texas-Mexican border in 1877. And most of the people in the village were massacred during the day of screams. There were some men who were out on a small hunting expedition. And when they returned home, they found the bodies of many of the people who had been killed, but they didn't know what happened to two children who were later named Jack and Cassetta. What we know from the documents in the archival material back east is that they were taken by the 4th U.S. Cavalry and they rode with them for about three years before they were taken to the Carlisle Indian School. 
Um, it was there that Cassetta was also, who was the longest enrolled student actually at Carlisle, was sent out on outings. And she had a little baby while she was out on an outing. And when she died of tuberculosis, that little boy, Dick Casita, was sent back to the Carlisle Indian School. So it was piecing together some of the story back east. And Jackie, who you'll be hearing from at the end of the trailer, um, contacted um, by email uh, some of the Lipan Apache Band of Texas. And so we have this story of these two children and wanted to see if you had more information about what was happening with the Lipan Apache at this time. And that's when Daniel Castro Romero immediately responded to her and said, how do you know about the story? We thought only the family knew. And so the piecing together the story really took the oral history and the stories that had been passed down from generation to generation among the Lipan Apache band and the archival material to discover what actually happened to the children. And they then came to Carlisle to do the blessing ceremonies for all three children. So the, the trailer tells a little bit of the story of these three children and an introduction to the Carlisle Indian School. Um, so I think what we'll do is go ahead, Sam, and show the trailer, and then Jackie will give a little more information later on. It's a very emotional thing for my people. A lot of our people won't talk about it. it it's really scarred our families for three, going on four generations now. And every time someone would speak up and say something about it, it was always said, leave it alone. One day someone's gonna come and show us where our little ones are at. Cassetta's story was obviously being slowly pieced together here in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. But meanwhile, in Texas, it had never been forgotten. And every year, the Lipan Apache memorialized all the lost ones from Remolino and other massacres. And included in that are, of course, Jack and Cassetta, whose names are not mentioned. They are the lost ones. These two children are Lipan Apache living on the Texas-Mexican border with their family, with their band, and at, this is the time when there's massive expansion of the white population into this whole region, and so there's a whole series of forts built by the U.S. Army to protect the settlers. When the Lipan Apache were raiding across the border and often withdrawing to the Mexican side, Ulysses S. Grant gave Randall McKenzie permission to go across the border, to ignore the Texas-Mexican border, to make raids on these Lipan Apaches. And the most memorable one was when Randall McKenzie went across the border and essentially massacred a whole band when the um, warriors were away, and so it was basically women and children. And this is known as the Day of Screams. And the children are actually hidden by their mother in some bushes where they're found by the soldiers. 
who think that they're the only survivors. And the children are then taken in by the family of one of the bandsmen in the 4th Cavalry. And for three years, they travel around with that family. So they never return to their own families, and they never see their own people again. But they are semi-adopted by the Smith family, Charles and Molly Smith. And we know that from a surviving photograph, which is the beginning of the piecing together of the special story of these two children. Because in 1991, Celeste Sorgio, the granddaughter of Charles and Molly Smith, Celeste Sorgio wrote to the Cumberland County Historical Society and sent a photograph of the two children, who at that time were called Cassetta and Jack Smith. And it shows the children in their Sunday best, and it's dated March 1880. And that photograph was perhaps taken as the last memorial for these children before they were forcibly removed and sent to the Carlisle Indian School in Pennsylvania. Written on the back of this photo is, it says, um, Cassetta and Jack Smith. And then it says underneath um, that they called Molly my wife, and it's obviously written by Charles, Mama. So it sounds as if they had found um, some kind of a home with this white couple. They moved to the Carlisle Indian School. Cassetta is a little bit older than Jack. He's a, she's about 13, and Jack is about 10. The photograph taken at Carlisle is more difficult to date, but it's a very similar time period because the children look almost the same age. So we can match the two photographs and say, these are the same children. These are the children that left Kansas and came to Pennsylvania. When the Carlisle Indian School was founded in 1879, the very first groups of children to come came from the Rosebud Sioux and Pine Ridge Sioux reservations. And then other Plains groups came in. Uh, this was in October of 1879. By the time the school closed in 1918, there were over 10,000 children who came through uh, the Carlisle community and lived at the Indian school. Children were typically enrolled for a period of three to five years. Oftentimes they would re-enroll. And you know, if you look, if you look at this sea of children behind me, I mean, these children came from virtually every nation. So if you imagine a map of the United States and parts of Canada and Puerto Rico and just span across that map, starting with Alaska natives and mission children from California, Blackfeet from Montana, Crow, Assiniboine, Hidatsa, Mandan, Chippewa. You had Anishinaabe kids from um, Michigan, uh, Midwestern states. You had Six Nations kids from New York State, Mohawk, Cayuga, Oneida, Seneca, um, Tuscarora. You had Abenaki from Maine. So, you know, just imagine all of the 550 federally recognized tribes. They all were represented at Carlisle during that era. So the very first groups of children to come didn't speak English at all. And the purpose of the school was to assimilate them, to try to get them swallowed up. You know, there were these very violent metaphors that Richard Henry Pratt, the founder, used to describe this process. Um, he, he used the um, analogy of Christian baptism. He said, we like to take these children and hold them under until they are thoroughly soaked. And when, when they come out, they will be so-called civilized. So that was the goal, to take these children who came from almost uh, hundreds of different cultures, language groups, spiritual ways, and, and change them, transform them into carbon copies of their European American brothers and sisters. The clothing is removed. Some of it goes down to the Smithsonian, some of it is, uh, just disappears. The hair is cut, and of course, because the children are inside, and also because the lighting of the camera is used very skillfully, the children look 
much paler, much whiter in the after pictures. So you can see before your very eyes the civilizing process visually translated in these portraits. There are no pictures of what Cassetta would have looked like in her Lepan Apache dress because she had already been with the Smith family for three years and the same for Jack. But of course there are students who arrived straight from the reservation and who had been dressed in their very best clothing and who were wearing all their regalia, full regalia when they arrived as a kind of honour for their leaving and who then of course had photographs taken in their school uniform. So the contrast is dramatic. Cassetta is, for the Carlisle Indian School, almost the ideal student in many ways because she's totally deracinated. They wanted to break the, cult the contact with the traditional culture. Cassetta comes with that break already made and so she's included in a lot of the photographs that are taken and she's also one of the many children that are featured in a postcard. It's a photograph that's turned into a postcard which is entitled Our Boys and Girls. It's part of a commercial series that's sold by the school where the, the heads of the children who have had their portraits taken in their school uniform are placed on a single postcard or um, slide that's then sold. So she is one of our boys and girls. She's very much at the forefront in the early days of the school because she arrives 1880 and the school's only been running for a year. Cassetta, Cassetta was in, had wounds on the front and back of her shoulder and the side of her neck. And when they asked how they got them, how she got them, she told the story that her mother had tried to kill her in order to keep her from the American soldiers. And this, of course, is interpreted as an act of savagery by the Carlisle School rather than an act of desperation by a mother trying to protect her daughter. Cassetta would have lost her family when she was around 10, so prepubescent. But when she came to Carlisle at around 13, she would have been exactly the age when she would have had a very important ceremony for her, the Apache puberty ceremony, where she would have been honored as a woman and the wisdom of women would have been given to her and shared with her and she would have taken her place in the family as a Lipan Apache woman with all that knowledge. But instead, instead of the beautiful um, garments that she would have worn for that ceremony, instead Cassetta is put in the school uniform and she learns to march and she learns to drill and she learns to read and write rather than the traditional wisdom that might have been hers. Um, after Cressetta passed away, this little boy ended up in the Carlisle community and, and literally was the baby of the school. On his f application form, it's listed that he is tribe Lipan Apache. So here is the child of Cassetta, who is supposed to have had all Indianness eradicated from her, who is now being given a tribal affiliation of a group he's never met, and he's actually not even going to quite remember who he is or know who he is later on. So he's sent to the Carlisle Indian School, much younger than any of the other students. By this time, Carlisle is taking students off the reservation who've been through the schooling system, so a higher um, level in the school and are older. So he sticks out as very unusual. He became like the mascot. He was the mascot at the school when he was arrived because he was the baby. There were no other Indian children who were four years old, so he was already called the Carlisle baby. There is a big silence about what has happened because of the pain and because of the um, extraordinary dis cultural and psychological disruption it's caused. So some of the communities carry these stories, others there's been a huge silence and it's the grandchildren of the students who are returning to find out about their grandparents. One of the most remarkable things for me as I was dealing with the written record and the photographic record was learning that there's this other record that's carried on through four generations that carries this story down the generations and doesn't allow it to die. We have to tell the story from the other side. The other side being the spiritual world, being the world that most people call heaven, the other, you know, we reach into that world to tell our story to bring it back. Our people cannot move forward 
until our lost ones are sent home. And then I said, and we'll pray and do certain prayers that I'm going to do. And then the final act will be to spread the ash and to lay rock and walk away. Then from that point on, I give prayer maybe. And my prayer is going to be that come tomorrow on the anniversary of, of you being taken from your people and from our people and from our families, that we ask the Creator to open the door and let her in. Sit down. In August every year, our families have always met. And uh, we've always set an empty plate out. And, and that's so we won't forget. This year's family reunion will be, we won't put the plate out no more. So, um, that um, story of the two children is, was a sem I assembled the story, but obviously there were a lot of people who collaborated in helping the story be brought together. Um, the first person who made the connection between little Richard Cassetta and Cassetta Roosevelt, as her name was, was an Australian historian or anthropologist called Genevieve Bell. So when I was looking in the archives, I already knew about the connection, but the story is assembled from the archives. Cassetta never speaks. She has never, there's never anything reported of her words, but from the archives, from her outing information, from the newspaper articles, we can piece together how she lived, what happened to her, her comings and goings from the school. And then when she came back to the school after one outing and it was discovered she was pregnant, and then she disappears from the record and she's sent away to the Rosine home to have her baby Richard. And the Quakers allow her to keep her baby. But after three years, she dies, sadly, which is when he returns. So that is the part of the story that we can get from the archive. And it was when I wanted to find out what came next or what was happening at the other end before she arrived, that I looked for a history of the Lipan Apache, and there was none written at that time. There are two now, but there was a little history online with a name against it, which was Daniel Castro Romero. So I emailed him and I asked him, describe what we knew about these two children and said, did you know anything about these two Lipan Apache children who were taken away and brought to Carlisle? And he came back immediately and said, no, we knew nothing about them. We didn't know what happened to them. And how do you know about this? Because this is a very private family story. And so then we had obviously a correspondence and sent photographs. And that is how um, we put the two sides of the story together. And the Lipan Apache came to Carlisle. So the archive, which we're bringing you to today for you to explore and find your different stories and your ancestors' stories, the archive carries a lot of information all wrapped up in the official language. But the stories in the communities are the vital other half of the stories of all these children. It's where they came from and it's where the vast majority, not Cassetta, but the vast majority returned. So I'm going to pass you over to Barbara Landis because she's going to talk to you about some of the many children that came with a focus on the Alaskan children who came to Carlisle. So when we de when we um, decided we wanted to come to Alaska um, for this visit, I went into the, the archives, the Carlisle Indian School Digital Archives, and decided to use photographs as a touching off point 
for introducing some of the children who came from Alaskan communities. And so what I've done is gone through the images part of the digital archives and searched out Alaskan names and wanted to show them as a way to talk about my um, understanding of the history of the Carlisle Indian School, kind of tie that together. And this PowerPoint has um, a lot of information in it, in the notes and in, in the slides themselves that you might be interested in. So this will be accessible to you as a Google Doc, or I can send it um, directly to anyone who might be interested in exploring it further. Um, this slide is pretty universal. Many of you, I'm sure, have seen it. Um, in the trailer that you heard us talking about numbers of students, we mentioned 10,000 students and 550 federally recognized tribes. Since this archive has been in full swing, or close to full swing, I should say, because we're always adding more materials to it, we've um, discovered that the actual number of enrollment is closer to about 7,800 children. And of those 7,800, 127 are identified as Alaskan. So um, those 127 Alaskan children are who I wanted to focus on for this presentation. And of course, now I believe there are over 560 uh, federally recognized tribes. So these numbers are changing, obviously. But one of the first things we discovered when we came to the conference in Anchorage a few days ago was the heavy of Reverend Sheldon Jackson and how much he had, because he was the um, head of the Presbyterian missions in um, Alaska, he, or Presbyterian missions in general, he became the head of education, Indian education in Alaska, but he had so much influence and he recruited many, many children from the Pueblos. We find that he recruited children from Oklahoma, from other uh, areas where he had been traveling and doing mission work. But the close contact in Alaska to Jackson was Edward Marston. And what we know is that Edward Marston was the sort of protege of Jackson who was bringing children from the communities from which he was associated. And he and his wife, Lucy Kinnanook, actually accompanied children to the Carlisle School during um, the time that Alaskans were coming in. So here is a listing of the communities in Alaska. Hey, Barbara, can you hear me? School. Um, and five from Ketchikan, 12 from Metlakatla, um, five from Saxman, 10 from Sitka. And then if you look at the last entry, it has 18 for whom no uh, home agency or community is given. So we have yet to uncover the actual direct communities. And so we don't know who those children came from, what clans they belong to, what communities they came from. So obviously there's much more to discover about these children. The first children to come were Henry Phillips and Fred Harris. 
and they came from the Presbyterian mission in Sitka. They were brought directly by Sheldon Jackson. Henry Phillips became a printer and was one of the editors of the school newspapers. And um, Fred Harris, unfortunately, was one of the children who passed away at Carlisle and is buried at the Carlisle Indian Cemetery. Uh, Lauren Peters is from um, one of the islands from uh, St. Paul Island. She recently repatriated her great auntie um, named Sophia Tatoff, and she put together this map that identifies the, the route that children would have taken from Alaska specifically St. Paul Island, but from Southeast Alaska area, all the way to Carlisle. And it was her um, determination that it would have been about a 27 day journey to travel from that island to Carlisle in 1901, would have been by um, steamship and then by train getting to Carlisle. These are two boys who came into the school in 1890. So I'm kind of going chronologically, starting with the earliest children to be sent. Now by 1890, these two boys were enrolled. And around that same time, there were six Alaskans who were brought east um, to Carlisle by Sheldon Jackson. So this would have been you know, that group with um, Henry Phillips and um, Fred Harris. And there was a girl named Florence Wells who came and she was the, it seems that this group of girls, instead of being brought directly to Carlisle, were kind of uh, bypassed into Northfield, Massachusetts, into um Mr. Moody's school, and I would assume that Mr. Moody was probably a Presbyterian missionary. Some of you may know his name. We don't know when the other girls came or who they actually were, but we do know that Florence Wells graduated in the class of 1894. And along with James Flannery, who had come from Chamawa, and Flora Campbell, who had come from Sitka. And we know that of the 127 children to come in from Alaska, um, 28 of them graduated, which statistically is a really high number of students to graduate because um, of the entire student body of 7,800 or so children, only 758 graduated. So that's about a 9% graduation rate. When you look at these numbers of Alaskan kids, um, 28 out of 127 is a really high rate. That's about a 22% graduation rate. So these children very likely in the main had had previous schooling before they came to Carlisle. The class of 1899 included Mary Moon, who was Clinkett from Juneau. She arrived in 1896, she was 15 years old. Also in this class was Kendall Paul from Sitka who came at age 11. So he was pretty young in 1899, five years later, he was 16 when he graduated. Dora Reinken came in in July of 1897. She was Aleut from Unalaska, and she graduated in the class of 1905. She married a Seneca man who may also have been a Carlisle student and was living up in Rochester, New York for a while, but then returned to Alaska. Um, you may recognize these names, Mr. and Mrs. Thomas Hanbury. Um, Thomas Hanbury came with that group um, in 1905. Well, no, this is a picture of them after he had gone back to Carlisle. And he had responded to a survey 
that the school sent him in 1910 and, or 1911, was showing a photograph of his wedding picture from 1905 and then with his two little girls. And he had written a note um, that sadly he had lost his wife before he had sent these photos to Carlisle. Thomas Hanbury was one of the printers. And in this uh, photograph, he's second to the right of the um, photo editor, Mariana Burgess, in the middle of that uh, photograph with a whole group of printers. Um, at, at Carlisle, most of the trades were typically segregated by gender with the exception of printing. There were male and female printers that were trained to um, typically go into government service or work as printers after they had um, finished their time at Carlisle. But in general, trades were identified along gender lines. So uh, girls would have learned cooking, cleaning, sewing, childcare, laundry, and boys would have learned blacksmithing, tinsmithing, um, farming, carriage making, shoe repair, um, the kinds of trades that boys supposedly would have been learning around the turn of the century. And at, at the printing shop, out of the printing shop grew these publications. They were weekly and monthly magazines and newspapers. And oftentimes we search them to find information about students at the Indian school, although they're heavily slanted in their picture of what was happening at the school, they tended to present the experiment as this very heroic endeavor. Still, there's um, a lot of good information that can be gleaned about children's experience at the Indian school. So, one of the things that they often did was they would reprint articles from other boarding schools in these weekly and monthly publications. And one of the reprints was um, a, an article from the North Star. It's, and in the paper, it says the North Star is a new and interesting little paper published monthly away up in Alaska by Reverend Sheldon Jackson blah, blah, blah. And so you could go through newspapers. If you did a search for the North Star in the site, you'll find all the references to Sheldon Jackson's work. Here's an article about the coming of the Russians to Sitka, Alaska. Um, I doubt any of it is really true. Perhaps it is, but it might be interesting for you to look at that. And the Indian School, as you know from Sheldon Jackson schools, was very regimented, organized kind of as a military style school with um, military ranking system and units and battalions. And um, students were organized that way and set up to um, sort of police each other in this military way, but there also was a school band. And so those students would have been in uniform in their band uniforms. We know of nine Alaskan uh, young men, males who were part of that Indian school band. And the Indian school band uh, marched at every single presidential inaugural in Washington, DC. And they also performed in the summertime on the boardwalk on the New Jersey shore. So they would have been at the seashore. Bertram Charles was a student at Carlisle. Healy Wolf um, was another graduate in the class of 1902. He had had five outings at Carlisle. And you may wonder what are outings? Outings were in the summertime when students at boarding schools would typically be expected to go home, these children did not go home. They went out with a capital O into non-native families 
living in outlying areas to the Carlisle Indian School and kids who went into these homes, and that would be almost all the children enrolled at the school, would be doing some kind of either unskilled labor if they were guys, and they would have been working on a farm or maybe working at the Bethlehem Steel Company or working in a blacksmith shop. And the girls would have been cooking, cleaning, sewing in various households. And in some cases, they would be earning a minimal wage during that outing system. And the um, Digital Resource Center has ledgers, financial ledgers, that show the earnings that students earned on outings. So outings would have been um, in the states neighboring Pennsylvania, Ohio, there were um, a bunch of boys who were sent out into the Ford Motor Company in Michigan. Um, there were boys out in Maryland, in New York State, Massachusetts, um, all, all these neighboring states. And this is a collage of uh, students on outing doing what you would typically expect would be their experience working on farms, working in shops. And there was a contract, and that's what these outing rules show. Every student would have signed a contract and would have um, agreed to a certain set of rules. Uh, for example, they would have to agree to bathe once a week. They would have to go to church and Sunday school with their outing non-Native siblings. Um, they would not be allowed to trade places at the farms where they were living. And they were not supposed to go to Philadelphia. Philadelphia was like Sin City, so they couldn't go there. And they made this agreement between the outing student and the superintendent of the Indian school and the outing patron or the head of the household for the family that they would be living with. Um, some children had as many as 10 outings. Most children had uh, generally around two or three outings. And the children who had multiple, multiple outings were spending a lot of time in households outside of the Indian school and were not really physically present at the school. So these two sisters, Sosipatra Suvarov and Irene Suvarov, um, they arrived at the Indian school about a year apart. Sosipatra was four years older than Irene and they both were sent out into the same family, which was rather unusual from what I've seen. And they both had very long outings with this particular family in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. So um, one would have been there for about 15 months and the other was there for 18 months. And there was an, a period of overlap right in the middle of their outings where they were in this household together. So um, like I said, that is really unusual. Here on the left, you see a group of girls all dressed up in their fine clothes with hats, waiting for the Gettysburg area train to come and take them to their outings. And in the right-hand side of the slide are a group of boys who were sent out into the Ford Motor Company in Dearborn, Michigan in the 1910s. Ford had in the factory a school for immigrants, and Pratt had a relationship with Ford and had these kids sent to the Ford Motor Company. And so um, they lived at the factory and they took training at the factory and some of them ended up staying in that uh, Detroit area. This is a group of young men who, uh, many of whom had been uh, four boys, and they took employment at the 
Island Weapons Factory in Philadelphia. Remember the name? No. Okay. Um, Anna Buck and Cookie Gluck. These are two children who came from Port Clarence, Alaska. And they arrived in 1897. Um, this group from Port Clarence was photographed when they arrived and then several years later in their photographs that the school administrators used to publicize the quote success of the experiment. Even though probably all these children went back to Alaska. And by success, I'm gonna identify or explain that in terms of Richard Henry Pratt, the founder of the school. In his um, view, success would be for children to become assimilated and literally get swallowed up in the dominant culture. And you know, by his measure, by those standards, the Carlisle Indian School was absolutely not a success. And those statistics are borne out with the uh, Digital Resource Center because we know that almost all these children went back to their home communities and um, often would send back letters describing what they were doing. And um, it seems that most of the males who um, came from Alaska, especially from Southeast, were fishing when they returned to uh, their home communities. Joseph Sheehan came from Unalaska at age 12, and he is an exception to what I was just talking about because he um, settled in the Baltimore area. Baltimore, Maryland is a little less than two hours uh, south east of Carlisle. It's very, Washington, D.C. is about an hour and a half south. We're not far from those centers of um, government and uh, port areas. So um, here you have one young man who ended up marrying a local girl from Baltimore and sending back clippings of his sports prowess after he left Carlisle. Um, this is an example of a mock opera that was performed at Carlisle in 1909 and 1910 called The Captain of Plymouth. And it was based on Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's poem, The Courtship of Miles Standish. So here you have Indian girls dressed up as Indian girls with cradle boards performing these roles in that particular mock opera. And in this, um, these scenes, there were several Alaskan students who participated and were in the cast of this. Patrick Verney, Michael Tibitnoy, and Emma Esetuk were all um, actors in these performances. Michael Tibitnoy um, was, from Woody Island. He was from the Baptist Orphanage. There were a group of kids who were brought in from that orphanage. And um, this particular young man was a really good baseball player. And so he was recruited by the Hershey Chocolate Factory in Hershey, Pennsylvania, along with nine other students, male students who also happened to be really good baseball players. So they were put on Hershey's baseball team and they worked as a, at a summer job in the chocolate factory in addition to playing baseball and winning baseball games for Hershey. Um, again, this is um, a reference that includes Michael Chibitnoy and all these people who came from that orphanage on Woody Island, Kate Shepard, Anastasia Ashwak, John Lochesnikov, oh, these Russian names, <laughs> Theodore Shelikov, Sashka Alexander, George Galatkinov, and Michael Tibitnoy. 
So um, another one of these people, these kids was Nikifer Suchek, who happened to be a really great athlete. And he played football on one of the very famous football teams that um, predated the football teams that Jim Thorpe played on. But I had to show, I had to include Jim Thorpe in, in this because is, you know, I have to include Jim Thorpe in any program about Carlisle because really it was Jim Thorpe who put Carlisle on the map. And just in the last um, month or so, um, his Olympic records that had been taken from him after he won the decathlon and pentathlon at the 1912 Olympics, he was the gold medalist. His um, medals were and records were unjustly taken from him and that's a long story that probably many of you know but those olympic records were just restored recently and also there is a brand new biography about jim thorpe that just came out today it was published um, by the uh, biographer david marinus um, and, and it promises to be a great story about the greatest athlete of the 20th century. Um, this is a student who arrived in 1902, Ephraim Alexander, along with these other two guys, Isaac Gould and Paul, I can't read his name because my little box is covering, Paul Dirks. Um, but Ephraim Alexander was on outing at um, a pastor's home, I believe a Presbyterian pastor's home. And unfortunately he died at his outing and is buried in the community where that outing family was in Lidditz, Pennsylvania. Here's an example of a student um, writing back and showing the photograph of his home church, um, Presbyterian Church of Council. And he's writing back that his family is all well and he gives us a photograph of him all decked out for winter. In October of 1903, there was the largest group that, that we know of of children that were sent from Southeast Alaska. And um, these children were, some, some were very, very young. Um, Margaret Brown, Maggie Brown was only seven years old when she came in this group. Mary Kinnanook was only nine years old when she came in this group. And Margaret Brown was at Carlisle for Oh, I think 12 years just before she was married, she um, returned back home, but um, she became a teacher. She went to Westchester Normal School in Pennsylvania, and um, Paul Kinnanook, who was a cousin, was advocating for the school to send her back home, and, you know, she kind of was shuffled around from place to place before she finally was sent, was able to go home and she taught in her community um, for many years. I, Mary Kinnanick's story is, is a very different and very tragic story because she passed away at Carlisle and her family has been working now for 20 years, I guess, to try to have her return to her home community. And so that is an ongoing um, endeavor. And, you know, we, we've been all trying our best to support the family in, in this important effort. You know, it's become a labor of love for all of us to be connected to that family. And this group of 31, they came from Haida, Simshian, and Metlakatla, uh, uh, Port Chester, Port Gravia, Saxman, and Kassan. 
Um, uh, in this group were 16 girls and 15 boys. One was Catholic, two Episcopalian, and all the rest were Presbyterian. And they were, again, tied to Edward Marsden. Marston. Um, of this group, three graduated. Two of them were buried at the Carlisle Indian School when they passed away. Seven were sent home because of ill health and one ran away. And we know from their follow-up surveys that most of the men were fishing or woodworking, carving when they went back to catch a can. And the last student to be sent from Alaska was Frank Verrigan in 1917. Um, I have just one more slide after this. I wanted to mention the um, importance of the repatriations that have begun. And they really were um, initiated by Mary and Willard Jones and Eleanor Haddon, their daughter, who had been working so hard, have been working so hard all this time to try to get information to the army to um, bring their children home, their child home. But the, this group of Rosebud Sioux young men and women um, began their journey to repatriate their relatives when they uh, um, were teenagers and went to the, attended the Native Tribal Youth Council that Barack Obama initiated. So that was back in, I believe, 2015. And so when they came through Carlisle and took a tour of the Indian school grounds and went into the cemetery and saw the names of their relatives, they had no idea that these relatives had been buried at Carlisle and were, the remains were still there. So through their efforts, um, many of their relatives were repatriated last summer. And Deb Holland, who is the Secretary of the Interior, came to the ceremony um, to be with them when they um, went through that transfer ceremony with the United States Army. And these kids were also a, a little bit starstruck because the actor Mark Ruffalo decided to show up as well and was invited by um, the Oglala Sioux tribal headman. So um, they got to take a picture with the Secretary of Interior and Mark Ruffalo, and they were a little bit starstruck, but they were truly the stars of this event. And this is my last slide. Um, these are the people we truly love. Willard and Mary Jones, who Pat, Mary passed away a couple of years ago. We've lost both of them, but Eleanor and her brother Laird are still um, determined to bring Mary home. And they will. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm gonna turn this back over to Jackie. Pull up this side. Yep, I'm gonna try. Or is Susan gonna do it? Maybe I have to do it. I don't have it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I will find it. Barbara, are we going, our next is that Jackie is going to show the, the website. Yes. And, and I just yeah. want to hear that um, of, of our participants, our attendees, that I do see Eleanor, who is who is with us and, and participating, and that, um, you know, to acknowledge and recognize that during our in-person gathering and convening that Laird was there and was able to share with um our community, uh, the efforts that are being undertaken by their family to ensure that their relative and is able to come home um, 
and the efforts that are underway. And as those um, become more concrete uh, ways that us as you know the tribe and tribal citizens can support their efforts um, to, to see Mary return. So I just wanted to acknowledge that that Eleanor is with us um, and Gurnath Chish Eleanor and others um, that are here this evening, other relatives that may be here who have um, ancestors tied to, to Carlisle. You know, I wonder, Jackie, before you share the site, whether Eleanor, would Eleanor mm -hmm. like to speak? Eleanor, um, that might be more meaningful even than, than us. We could do a very short time introducing the site. If Eleanor wanted to speak, Laird, um, Eleanor, if you would like to speak or, or share, um, if you could put something in the chat that just acknowledges, um, we can pull you over as a panelist if, if you would like, or if there are any other relatives um, connected to the individuals that attended Carlisle, um, please let us know and we can, we can have you added as a panelist. Should I stop the share? I don't know if there's ways. Should I stop the, take down the site, Sarah? No, we can just give it a, a moment. Um, I'm, I'm watching the chat and just to see, I haven't seen anything come through. If you wanna go ahead and um, speak to the site, we can just monitor. And, and if anyone does raise their hand, we can bring them over. Yes, and, and do feel free to interrupt me because I'm just going to give tips um, about how People who want to do a little bit of research using the site might. Can I? Ah, thank you. Bob is just helping me out by taking the box out of the way. So just to say that I didn't help build the site, and normally um, this part of the program will be done by our archivist librarian at Dickinson, who did help build the site. I am a user of the site, so I'm a researcher. So I'm just yeah, going Jackie. to. I apologize. I can't see it on my end, but I understand that Eleanor does have her hand raised. And so if we could pause and um, allow her to come over. Hello. Hi, Eleanor. Good evening. Grinth Chish for joining and, and being willing to share. Yes, um, I would say Barbara and Susan and uh, Jackie, they've all done a great job of helping with the research. Um, you know, without their work, we wouldn't have the information. I, again, the, we keep talking about how it was all pieced together. Uh, we're still putting the pieces together. Uh, <clears throat> but we do know that Mary is there. For a long time, we thought she was there by herself. And then later on, we found out she was with her older brethren with a cousin. Um, so that helped knowing that she did have family with her. Um, but still, she died without her immediate family being with her. Uh, it's been a long journey. My mom started looking in 1967. And so it was in the um, late 1990s before we started finding out more information about Mary, where Mary was. Um, it's been a long journey. It's been a very emotional journey. Um, thanks for all the help that we've received over this time and all the support. Yeah, that's all I have to say right now. Mm, goodness, Chish. Thank you, Mary, for for sharing and being here this evening. And um, and you know, as things progress, um, I, I I know that those of us that were there were listening to ways to uphold your your family um, in in this journey as you guys continue to work to bring Mary home. Um, when the letters and other things become an option, uh, Laird was speaking to that. And I know many were, were ready to, to see how they could support this um, 
this effort. Uh, um, I'm getting a note from another attendee that the chat feature is is disabled. It's disabled. Uh, Colleen is uh, Colleen James is on with us, and uh, I've received a message that they're unable to chat. It says it's disabled. Good news, so Sam. Sam. We'll have Sam look into that, but if folks would like to speak, we do know the raise your hand function works. So if you raise your hand, we'll click and allow you to speak. We apologize for that technical difficulty. Yeah, I'm looking at the settings now. If I can um, find the right one, I'll, I'll enable it. Thank you, Sam. Colleen and others, if, if you would like, if you can't, um, chat but would, would like to say something that if you raise your hand we can we can bring you over as a a, a panelist Sam Colleen has her hand raised. Can you bring her over? Or Nethka Kuge? Yep. And I think I just got the chat enabled. Oh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, good. I This is Colleen. Um, my clinket name is Dach Kitlach. And I just wanted to say good night um, my great grandma margaret brown and i'm um, just thankful that you folks brought her name forward um i think that this group has also been in touch with my mom norma jean and i don't know if she is tuned in but um i just wanted to say goodness chief for all of your good work and to eleanor too for representing the family and for all the good work that um mary and uncle willard did just so much here happening Ms. Cheesh. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Norma, I'm sorry. Yeah, Norma Jean was in many ways the one who helped organize all of this <laughs> in our trip uh, and visits to various communities. And we had Thank a wonderful you. dinner with her and Francis. Yes, that's what my mom said. She was so tickled when we came to visit her uh, this past weekend. And she, that's all she could talk about was um, meeting with all of you folks and, and all the beautiful um, people who turned out and turned up for you folks. Um, all the wonderful folks, the descendants of Carlisle, um, just showing, showing up to share their stories. And so goodness, Cheesh, thank you. Goodness, Cheesh, Colleen. Um, Eleanor, you're welcome to stay with us as a panelist, and please feel free as we go through. Um, and Jackie, if you would like to, I, I know that kind of the last thing was to show the um, the database and the archive and, and how some tips of, of utilizing it if individuals would like to be able to research and see. You know, one thing that I wanted to share was this was kind of a more in-depth presentation, and the Galactinoff family was listed and they actually are a family from Prince of Wales. Um, and so I didn't see it in the list of some of the children, but um, there, there's a, we have um, relatives on the island that go by Galactinoff. And so I was wanting to share that with, with them to see um, if they know of, of their relative that went to Carlisle. Make corrections. Mm, yes. Um, so maybe the best place for me to start is to say that we encourage anybody to come back, respond to this archive, which is a living archive. And there is at the bottom of each of the pages that there is a button which you can press and you can make corrections and you can make suggestions. And you can also send your own documents and your own information to the um, digital archive so that it can be um, included 
in this record, which is growing. It it starts. It is originally the um, the National Archive record that's obviously based in Washington. And the reason why it's it exists is because so many people were coming to Carlisle and looking for the records, which were not in Carlisle. They were down in the National Archives. And so the, the college applied for this digitalization um, grant from Mellon, which they won. And so there's over 300,000 items up there and they're being added to all the time. So the base is the National Archive, the student records that ended up in Washington, but now also the publications and the photographs, which uh, 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 a large group of them came from the Smithsonian, which have been added. So this is a growing um, and living archive. And if you have any questions, you can always um, send it to the to to if you if you go into the um, the bottom box here, um, you can see here is the email address right down here, Palal in School Project, and you can address and I they you will be answered. You it will not just be be ignored. So I'm just going to give you a couple of tips because we've had a very long presentation. And you may have questions, but the, probably the most obvious way in for most of us is through looking at this menu and looking at the student records. So if you click on the student records, then you can go to any individual by putting their name in the search um, box. And I'm just going to put in Marsden because we've been talking about Edward Marsden and he obviously was an important person. He wasn't a student but he's on the record because he would have been reported as being at the school and they would have claimed money for his rations. So this is his the records that they have for him in his student file. And not everything is there because you can go through the different categories in the menu to get things like the photographs. You, Barb showed you the photographs. So here are the photographs. If you go into images and you put in his name here, you can find the photographs that you saw that Barb had in her um, Barb and Jackie, I, I just wanted to let you know that you're well, lagging. The first one was that portrait, which is of him on his own. Whoops. We're what? We're lagging. I think the internet connection is a little bit unstable. Yeah. We're in the hotel, so I'm not sure there's anything I can do about it. So I'm just going to say two more things because it's tiresome to watch a report, a, a presentation that's that's lagging. I just want to make sure people know about the publications because we Barb showed some of the publications and the newspapers that came out of the school were very important. Um, and so you can search again for a name specifically in the searching with the publications, you can bring all the ones up with Marsden. And then you can search Jackie and Barbara individually. That froze pretty, like, mm -hmm. I think two words we were able to capture. It might help if you've turned yeah, off your okay. video to, to be able to share the last few tips. Okay. Okay, turn off, turn off, turn off the video. video. Yeah. Okay, we'll do that. Hold on here. Can you hear that? Yeah. Here? No. no. I'd have to stop sharing to turn yeah. off the video. Well, let's ask. Do we have to stop sharing to turn off the video? Nope, no, you video. turned off your video, but, but your audio okay. has become stronger. Oh, good. Okay. Um, thank you. I don't know how we did that. Okay, so then maybe I'm just going to say two more things. One is um, for anybody out there who's interested in teaching using these resources, we have um, sort of help aspect for which I have found very useful um, for teaching outlines of modules, but also one very specifically that you can teach students how to use the um, the um, where is it? Have I, have I gone past it? You can you basically how to use the archive. And we have teaching kits. So these have primary documents and you can find them online and download them as PDFs to use with your students or for your own use. 
So you can see there's a list of what's there, and then you, you go into a Dropbox file, which I'm not going to do, to find them. So the teaching resources, I think, are going to be something that can be very useful for a lot of different um, groups of people, college and high school. And then just to mention that, and this is again an ongoing um, tree for people who are searching for relatives. So you can look, you can explore the modern cemetery, which is the, the cemetery that was moved in 1927. And you can look at the records of the headstone and then there's resources for cemetery history. So for people who want to know a little bit more about their ancestors who were buried or might have been buried at Carlisle, we have um, documents out there. So I think we, we will be very ready to answer questions here or using that email address for anybody who would like to email the centre, there will be a response. And some of the documents that you might be looking for will be scanned, but may not yet be up here. So it's always worth trying and seeing if there's any information beyond what you can find on the site, because it's constantly growing. So I think I'm going to stop there, Sarah, um, and invite any questions or let you take it, take the, the meeting where you feel best it should go. Thank you. Um, we do have one question, and I just, uh, any of the attendees, if you um, have questions, uh, please feel free to use the chat feature. Um, we do have one from Michelle Bell. It says, are there records of the children who were sent to the Juno Indian Church? Do you know the answer to that? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. We don't know. No, we are we are we mic'd up? Yes. The Juno, we don't really know. Would that be sent from where to the Juno Indian Church? Was that a specific question? It, it's asking if there are records. Um, are there records of the children who were sent to the Juno Indian Church? And and I think, Michelle, that um, these this particular digital archive, um, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Susan, Barbara, and Jackie, but this digital archive is very specific to um, the Carlisle Industrial Indian School um, and the children that attended there. Uh, I, I, if there's a history or a connection between the the um, the Juno Church, um, it, it sounds like the presenters would need to um, see if there there was a tie. Um, I think that's something we'd have to research, but there are. There's a lot of projects taking place now with the different schools. There's a digitization project for Genoa, and there's a digitization project taking place at Riverside. So there are more and more of these records that are accessible to all of us from afar. But I don't know anything about the Juno Church, I'm afraid. Okay. I also want to mention that the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition is um, working on digital archives as well so um and they have a website um they're co commonly referred to as naps but their archivists might really be interested to know about the juno church school information thank you we have a few more questions and and comments uh dan um, shared that Barbara, when you were speaking, you were saying something about what you learned in Anchorage um, and you cut out. And I, if you can reshare what you were stating. Well, we learned a lot in Anchorage. I don't think I could enumerate how much we learned um, from the various groups that were presenting in Anchorage. But I think the thing that we really took away with um, from that those sessions was how much influence Sheldon Jackson had. Um, we Richard Henry Pratt is credited with the founder of this whole philosophy of the assimilationist uh, school. And um, what we are finding out is that Sheldon Jackson, had clearly as much influence as Pratt did and possibly more influence. So, um, you know, we're really curious to know more about Sheldon Jackson now 
after our visits here. That was one of Dan's uh, follow-up questions um, regarding what you were able to learn about Sheldon Jackson while you were here. But he had a, a few more questions. Um, was there anything more you learned about Mary Moon while you were here in Juneau? Yeah. Yes, um, we were really privy to hearing stories about Mary Moon and um, her presence after she came back from Carlisle and how important she was to the community. And we also visited her grave and her resting place. So, um, you know, Mary Moon has become much more real to us after hearing those stories and visiting her place of burial. And then um, we have one other um, question and then we have a hand raised, but um, the final question from Dan was, can you give a little background on the man in the bandstand? <laughs> oh, that's one for Jackie. <laughs> um, the man, the man on the bandstand um, is a sort of alter ego for the woman that run the print center that you saw in Bob's slide with all her printers, Mariana Burgess, MB, man on the bandstand. So, and she had this, he had this, she, he had this editorial voice in the Indian helper and would chastise the students and would suggest that he was this ever present figure standing on the bandstand. And if you've seen the layout of Carlisle, which I think in that particular picture of the marching band, you can see it's like a, the Carlisle campus is like a panopticon with the, the bandstand in the middle, and he is seen as being all seeing. So it's kind of creepy because he is this figure that is watching the students and spying on them and reporting them. So it's, um, it's a, he's a, a, I've written a little article about it because putting him to, putting together the pieces of how he's used is um, either, either very funny and jokey or else quite creepy, but it is Mariana Burgess speaking so thank you for asking that <laughs> did you did you guess that's who he was i imagine you perhaps would have then we have um bob sam who we know in in our region and community for for doing um the work um regarding our relatives and um he shares that edward marsden and founding of saxman and regards to the three orphans buried in Carlisle Cemetery. They were taken by Sheldon Jackson and Pratt. Um, so I wanted to share that, but I see that we also have a hand raised um, and if we could bring over. Uh... Yeah, we brought you over, Bob. Feel free to um, speak if whenever you're comfortable. Gonna shush. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to say, <laughs> Hello to Barbara. Hi. It's been many years. It's I've I uh, I wanted to thank you for and everyone involved with with the bringing home of our Carlisle children and particularly the ones that were taken by Sheldon Jackson and Pratt when when they were traveling through Alaska they 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 uh, took uh, four from from Ketchikan in the founding of Saxman and also the 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 uh, difficulty with with uh, finding descendants or of orphans, how to work through that so that we could bring them home mm -hmm. and. Uh, 
the other is Sitka Sheldon Jackson School has a cemetery, student cemetery, that also contains some unknown graves that goes back to the time when the founding of Sheldon Jackson was founded by orphans, as, as you stated. And Sheldon Jackson uh, was taken to court Hmm. and for his treatment of children back then, but, but they dropped the case because of his appointment to the education department. Hmm. The other thing is the marching band and the, the mention of Sitka and the... the there was an individual from Sitka who, who founded the marching band and the big band era of the Tlingit community was from this individual who was a conductor here in Sitka, but he, he went back to Carlisle a second time, but, but they didn't accept him into the school so he died in New York in poverty mm. on a mm. reservation because, as you know, Carlisle was a relocation program with little intent of bringing anyone home. That's right. the reason why the outing program was so, in, so intense. But, but the the success of the Alaska people it, and was, I'm so amazed by it. And the final thing is cooking, the lady cooking look, young lady, she's also buried in Carlisle Cemetery. Mm -hmm. Am I correct? The, yeah. And mm -hmm. and she she was she was the backbone of the whole group that Sheldon Jackson brought down there, even though she died of tuberculosis, she kept all the students going. The mm -hmm. the We'd be real proud of those kids in the early beginning of Carlisle history, of those <laughs> Alaska children who went down there. And the moment they were taken, they were no longer children. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. because they had bury themselves. There were no adult supervision for burying their loved ones, the children themselves. Bury each other. And Cooking Hook supported all the children. She was well loved when she passed away. Mm. Anyway, thank you, Barbara. It was good to listen to you and I just wanted to say hello. Gunashish. Thank you. Chish Bob for coming over and sharing. Um, I know that uh, this has been also a life's work of yours in identifying, ensuring that our ancestors are, um, that they're not forgotten and that we take the steps necessary to ensure that they're acknowledged and at times um, brought home and um, that steps and actions are taken so that they, that they can rest 
Um, I was just checking to see if we had any more questions and we don't. Um, I just want to thank um, our three presenters this evening for sharing um, the work that you have done to um, bring forward the, the archival records of, of all of our indigenous children that attended Carlisle. And I hope as you continue that our families, that those pieces continue to fall into place um, so that relatives um, can, can ensure that um, the necessary steps are taken. Um, so Gunnar Chish and Gunnar Chish Eleanor for, for joining us this evening um, and, and sharing and speaking about your family's journey. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to remind everyone that those uh, slides are going to be available um, in a Google Doc. So you can either get my email or go to the site and Jim Grenzer will, will know how to send that to you. Thank you for sharing that. Nechka Kuge, is there anything before we wrap up or Dr. Woods, is there anything before we close out our time together? I would just also echo our presenters today, Gunashish, Barbara, Jacqueline, and Susan for coming and not only doing this virtual event, but the lunchtime chat and the two in-person events. And Gunashish for the folk the person who had to leave earlier for a question, Kari, for others who had the same question, we will be discussing with our presenters and our communication staff here, Kink and Haida, about how we can continue to share more information about this and have this information reach a wider audience. And so I'm going to cheers to all of our attendees to spending this evening with us and to carry on discussions on this heavy topic. Thank you. Dr. Woods. Thank you. Uh, just the same. Um, thank you, everybody. And, um, you know, we, if you or somebody you care about needs um, one of us from our healing center to hold space, we're here for you. And um, all you have to do is con contact us either directly um, through our website. You could go to Clinkett and Haida's website and click on the CBS Healing Center and we have staff that are um, always willing to hold space for people. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Woods, Grant Chish. So thank you everybody, Grant Chish, for um, joining us this evening and um, we'll be sure to share out uh, the presentation and um, Grant Chish and I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. Thank you.